Lord. There's maybe some days that He may seem silent, He may be quiet, we may wonder, scratch our heads and wonder, where is God? But God has never been or nor will ever be off the throne. Sometimes God is gracious enough to remind us in gentle and subtle ways. But in our text today, God takes an approach that isn't so gentle and subtle. God gives the people a stark reminder, a wake-up call, if you will, of His majesty, of His sovereignty, and really, His holiness. So what happened? What happened in the Scriptures? What happened this passage, these first 11 verses that we read here? What exactly happened? First thing that ha we happened, that happened, we see here in the first several verses, it says, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with them uh, to bring up from there the ark of God. We just talked about that, which is called by the name of the host, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. The key here is verse 3. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart. And if you're one to write in your Bible, I would suggest that you underline the phrase, a new cart. Because that's important here. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and us in Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. First thing that I want to share with you this morning that happened is that really is what went wrong was David and the people of Israel put convenience over obedience. They put convenience over obedience. What happened here was just a mere act of disobedience by the people. Back in Exodus chapter 25, God gives the people of Israel strict instructions on how to transport the Ark of the Covenant. And it had nothing to do with a new cart. Exodus chapter 25 verses 14 and 15 says, And you shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the Ark to carry the Ark by them. And the poles shall remain in the ark of the the poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. In other words, God gave them strict instructions to carry the ark on their shoulders, not by using a cart. But the people of Israel, David in the game, chose convenience over obedience. I mean, if it was up to me, I'd much rather use a cart than put it on my shoulders. But then we find out in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, where they got the idea from. Remember what I told you a few minutes ago, after the Philistines had, had received judgment for having the ark of God, they sent it back to uh, David and sent it back to Israel. Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, we find out how they sent it back. It says in 1 Samuel 6 and 7 and 8, this is speaking of the Philistines, Now then take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows, on which there was and never came a yoke. And yoke the cows to the cart, but take their calves home away from them, and take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart, and put it in a new box at its side, the figures of gold, which you are returning to him as a guilt offering, then send it off and let it go its way. So what the Israelites had done is not only look for a convenient way to transport the ark, but they looked to a pagan nation and their idea of how to do it. That's a big no-no. That's bad. I don't know any other way to say it. Anytime you replace God's way with the world's way, it's bad. And God will not bless it. Oftentimes we can tend to put convenience over obedience. God hasn't called us to a nice, cushy life. Sometimes God gives us spring days where it's 80 degrees, and the sun's out, there's not a cloud in the sky, and it's wonderful outside. But there's some days when tornadoes come, and you're, you know, batting down the hatches, listening to James Spann, and praying for the Lord's protection. There's some days you're, you're, you're flying a kite, but some days you're hungering down in the storm shelter. Some days God gives us an easier road, but oftentimes He leads us down in the valley and He doesn't 
He doesn't waver on his instructions to us. He doesn't soften us because life becomes too hard for us. God still expects us to maintain his standards. Guess what, folks? God didn't give us the ten suggestions. God gave us the ten commandments. They're non-negotiable. God's word is paramount. And so we must hold it high. The first thing that they did wrong was the Israelites, David and the gang, chose to use the ways of the world, the ways of the pagan nation, to carry the ark of God, to carry out the presence of God by using that new cart. That's the first, and for, first thing that we find out that happened. Secondly, the thing that happened is that familiarity bred contempt. Now, the centermost person in this uh, passage here is a guy named Uzzah. Uh, kind of particular thing happened to Uzzah here as they were transporting this uh, Ark of the Covenant using this new cart, using the ways of a pagan nation. It started kind of tipping a little bit. It says in verse 6, And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Ezra, or Uzzah, had put out his hand to the ark of the God and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. Now it says nothing to do with the ark of the covenant actually falling off. It just said the, 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 the animals had stumbled. It didn't say anything about the ark of the covenant being in danger. It didn't say anything about the presence of God being in danger. All it said was that the oxen had assembled and Uzzah had put his hand to the ark of God to take hold of it. Now this again was a direct violation of God's law and God's standards. This was God's holiness. And there was strict instruction not to touch the ark of, God, ark of the covenant with their hands. But Uzzah was very, very familiar with the Ark of the Covenant. Why do I say that? Guess who his daddy was? His daddy was Abinadab. Now you ask, who was Abinadab? Well, Abinadab, we find out from 1 Samuel chapter 7, is the man and the priest who housed the Ark of the Covenant for some 20 years. Don't take my word for it. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 says, And the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they, were, <clears throat> and they consecrated his son Eleazar, Eleazar and to give him charge of the ark of the God. From that day forward that the ark was lodged at Kiriath Jerim a long time past, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now Uzzah is Abinadab's son. Uzzah grew up with the Ark of the Covenant in his house. I dare to say, and I presume, that it's quite possible that the Ark of the Covenant just became a fixture of furniture to Uzzah. Uzzah. Struggling with these things. It's quite possible that the Ark of the Covenant was, he was so familiar with the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence and, and the, the, the representation of God's presence that he, that he just became too comfortable with. That's why I said that familiarity bred contempt. In our life, oftentimes, sometimes in our church, familiarity brings contempt for God's holiness. We need to watch out. We need to be careful of that. The ark had been in the house for 20 years. Once again, it's, been, it was, it's possible that it had just become another piece of furniture. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that we never, ever take for granted being able to come into this church. I pray that we never, ever take for granted having the very Word of God at our disposal. I often think of the, the men and the women, the ministers, the pastors, the lay people all across this world that don't have nearly as much as we do. They don't have one complete Bible, much less multiple Bibles. I know I'm not the only one in this room that has multiple Bibles in my, in my house. I even have one Bible with multiple versions in it. 
We are filthy rich spiritually. But too often, I think, we take it for granted. Pastors in other countries get dragged off to jail. Burnt churches get burned down because they live in a pagan nation. And the gospel is being attacked all over this world. We serve in a time of blessing and a hope that we never take it for granted. A hope that familiarity never breeds contempt in our hearts. I hope that when we look at that piece of wood up there, that we never see a piece of wood up there. I hope that that right there never becomes just a piece of drawer that hangs around our neck. I hope the cross always represents and always reminds us of what God took us from, what He pulled us out of, Terry, what He cleaned us up from, what He sacrificed for. And I hope that every time we open the, the hymn books, every time we open the Bible, that we give Him the, the, the best that we have. I pray that we do more than just read words on a page. I pray that it goes down deep in our hearts. I pray that we give Him everything. I pray that tomorrow when we go into our workplaces and our communities, when we talk, anytime we talk to our families, it's never a message of I've got to go to church or I had to go to church. I pray that it's a message of I get to go to church. Amen. Will you come with me? Let me share, let me, let me tell you a story about that saved me. Let me, let me share with you. Let me lead you to a man that knew everything that I ever did and he still saved me. I don't care how long you've been going to church. I don't care how long you've been knowing the Lord. I don't care if you got saved as a little kid in vacation Bible school and, and you're old now. I don't care. It should be as fresh today as it ever was before. Revelation tells us, remember the height of which you have fallen. Go back to your first love. I pray that the gospel is as, as exciting today to us as it ever has been. I hope that it still causes us tears in our eyes when we think about what He saved us from. I hope that it still causes goosebumps. Not that it's all about feelings, but it should stir something within us. A lot of us give a lot more to Alabama football than we do the Lord. Don't shout me down today, but it's true. Familiarity often does breed contempt, and that's exactly what happened, I believe, in Uzzah's case, he had lived with the Ark of the Covenant in his house for 20 years. I wonder if it had just become another piece of furniture and not what it was intended to be. Number three, what happened here was I believe God allowed David in particular a healthy dose of fear. David didn't like what happened. I think David found himself in a lot of ways where we find ourselves when we read what happened to Uzzah. Uh, excuse me, Uzzah. It says in verse 8, And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. Look, when I read about what happened to Uzzah, I get angry. Well, that's not fair, God. All he was doing was trying to save the ark. All he was doing was trying to do what was right. That's not fair. It's almost as if as soon as David was angry, he was humbled at the same time because in verse 9 it says that David was afraid. He went from verse 8 from being angry to verse 9 from being afraid. God, David saw what God did. And he moved from anger to fear. I think it's good for us to have a little fear of God in our Look, I love the message that God is love. I love that passage. I love talking to people about God's grace, His mercy. Look, last week I had a message talking about the forgiveness of God. Look, I'm a recipient. Look, John's, the literal definition of the name John is God is gracious. I love God's grace. I love His mercy. I love all the things that He saved me from. I love that. But I'm also very aware that he can hit the spike button just like he did us in here and take me out. I also realize he is a holy God worthy of my respect, worthy of my worship. Pure worship. 
See, we, we don't need all the bells and whistles to worship God. We don't need a coffee shop. We don't need smoke machines. We just need to come before the presence of God and worship who He is. For who He is. And so God gave David a healthy dose of fear. In verse 10 it says, So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the good type for three months. Look, David was so shook that he had to get off trail. He had to take a time out and say, Whoa! He said, Who am I? Why has the ark come to me? I don't deserve this. Look, if for one minute you believe that you deserve salvation, you're wrong. None of us deserve salvation outside of God's grace and His righteousness is what He did. There wasn't anything that I ever did good to deserve that. But He smiled on me because He loved me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, I'm a whosoever. Look, I, I, I read a, a, a quote yesterday by Charles Spurgeon, and I'm going to butcher it, I'm just going to sum it up this morning. I'm going to believe in the electing of God, but until I, my dying day, I'm going to preach the whosoever. That's the message of the gospel that needs to be preached and needs to be shared today, is the gospel of the whosoever. Then it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter what's in your uh, bank account. It doesn't matter if you grew up in church. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. God is for you and God is died for you because He loves you. Amen. And His gospel is for you. And He desires you. And we are to fear Him. Don't ever forget Exodus chapter 3 when, when He confronted Moses in the burning bush. He said, boy, take your sandals off for where you are standing is holy ground. That should send shivers up your spine. Isaiah chapter 6. Read that, digest that, swallow that a little bit. Where Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord, a vision of the throne. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. Look, I'm not talking about walking constantly in an attitude of fear being fearful that we lose our salvation. For our salvation is secured not by us, not by our own doing, but by the seal of the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't walk in fear, but we should walk in fear. Okay? We shouldn't be scared, but we should have a healthy respect of God in our life. We should never take it for granted. David's self-righteous anger gave way to an understanding of who God really was. I think there is a big warning for us today. I think there is a huge warning. You know, we find warning labels on, on, on a lot of things today. Those warning labels are often in red. Those warning labels often should jump out to us and cause us to pause. I think there's a big warning label here on this passage. And there's three things that I want to remind you of this passage that should come out to us very, very clearly today. Number one is this. Go ahead and go to that next one, Jacob. Number one is this. Remember, everything looks good on the outside. Remember what was happening. Now, David loved music. Remember, David wrote most of the psalms that we had. And David used music to worship the Lord. And so he did. And David and all the house of Israel, verse 5, were celebrating before the Lord the songs and the lyres and the hope, harps and tambourines and the castanets and cymbals. Look, they were making a big hoopla. And it was good. And it looked good. Look, we can make a lot of things look good on the outside while the inside is rotting away said this before, I'll say it again today. You can paint the barn all day long, but if it's rotting, it's still going to fall down. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. You hear me this morning? Let me remind you, everything looked good on the outside. 
That's one of the ways that they went wrong. Now, well, I'll get to that in just a few minutes. Number two that I want to remind you of is this. Remember that David had good intentions. David, look, David was a man after God's own heart, but, and David had good intentions. He wanted to do what was right. He wanted to place the Ark of the Covenant where it belonged. David wanted to build a tabernacle for the Lord. David had good intentions. How many of you know, though, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions? It's not just a cliche, it's true. That often good people, you, look, when we step into eternity, we'll understand that there is a lot of good people in hell. There's a lot of people that sat in church week after week after week that are going to end up in hell. There's a lot of people that never said a cuss word and did good and was, was this part of, gave their money to this charity and was part of this group and uh, did this that are going to rot and die and go to hell because they never knew the Lord Jesus Christ. David had good intentions, but he was still wrong in what he allowed as far as how they transported and how they treated the glory of God. Number three, remember that Uzzah came from a religious family. Look, just because you grew up in church don't mean a hell of beans. Just because your daddy, just because your grandpappy, just because your grandmother, just because whoever, your Uncle Fred was a minister, just because you, you memorized this amount of Bible verses or that or that, whatever, whatever, doesn't guarantee that you're right spiritually. You can go through the motions, you can do all the right things, and still be wrong. Uzzah grew up in a religious family. Uzzah grew up with the Ark of the Covenant in the house. And he still reached out and touched the glory of God. He still did wrong. Now, I don't like the consequences. It's hard for me to swallow what happened. I love God's grace. And He's given me a bunch of it. But I also realized that he could do this too. And my goodness and my pedigree or whatever doesn't guarantee that he's going to give me favor. So remember that us, it came from a religious family. Psalm 119 verses 120. David said, My flesh trembles of fear of you and I am afraid of your judgments. Like I said a few minutes ago, I think it would do us good to have a little fear of God in our life. And I also think that we should never take for granted our salvation. I think we need to look at that passage and first of all be thankful for God's grace. But I also think that it should be a wake-up call for us. That, that we need to take seriously God's presence in our life. You know, it's easy as we still live in a country, no matter what's going on in our government, or whether we like it or not, we still live in a free country. We still live in a country of, of blessings. We still can get up every day and go to work and, and earn our own money. And we still uh, have blessings in our families and we still have this and that. I mean, we could talk about all the stuff that we have and all the ways that we are blessed. We live in luxury, really. And we live and we worship in luxury. We have air conditioning. We have carpet. We have nice places to sit. We eat. We have so much food on Wednesday nights. We eat and we eat and we eat and we we have good fellowship, and we we really have no fear of anyone busting through these doors and dragging us any any one of us to, to jail or anything like that. I think that we just need to take it seriously, our faith. I think we need to take a lesson from David and, and Uzzah and, and everything that happened there as, as they transported. Because look, just like God entrusted David and the Israelites with the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God, God has entrusted us with His presence. Each and every day, 
Every day we wake up, every time we come to church, we're entrusted with His presence. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to treat it with content or are we going to take it seriously? We're going to read our Bible, we're going to think, ah, I got other things to do. And the Holy Spirit convict us if we ever get to that point. Hey, get us in line. I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful for conviction. Because a lot of times he, he just passes go and just does what he did to us. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit says, uh, John, John, get back over here. Come back this way. I'm thankful for that. And you should be too. Alright? Terry, would you come up again and lead us in music? If we consider this passage today. Let's ask the Lord what He would have us to do with it. How He would have us respond. Heavenly Father, we thank You once again for Your Word. We thank You, God, for Your uh, blessings upon us, Your grace, Your mercy, God. But we also, God, thank You for this reminder that you're not only a loving God and a, a, a gracious God and a merciful God, but God, you are a God of judgment. You are a God of jealousy. God, we need to give everything to you. God, if anything, God, has taken the place of you in our life, if we have treated you, God, with contempt in any way, God, please forgive us. Please forgive us, God. Please give us your grace. Please give us your mercy. Please, God, clean our hearts today. God, if there's anybody here today under the conviction of the Holy Spirit about something in their life, God, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the courage to make that right before you. Not that you're waiting to beat them up or anything like that, but you're waiting to give them forgiveness and that you want to clean them and to forgive them and to give them that grace and mercy. But, I, God, I pray that you'd help us all take seriously your commandments and your standards your holiness and we thank you for it it's in Jesus name we pray Amen. Page 164 go ahead and stand with me and as we sing if you want to come down and kneel at the altar you may do that if you need me to pray with you